6. Give us this day. Prayer and the Present. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, and again in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, we are told by Moses and by Jesus Christ that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God doth man live. Because man is God's creature, and the Lord is the source and meaning of all of life. For man to live without God is to turn to death. However, because man is a creature, he cannot live without bread either. There always have been idiot religionists who have tried to be indifferent to food, eating, quote, only to live, end quote, they say, to prove their spirituality. What they have proven is their ungodliness. Scripture tells us that drink offerings were once required, and Psalm 104 verses 14 and 15 tells us of God. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. Temperance is required, but as creatures we are to rejoice in our creatureliness. To deny it is a sin. The Lord's Prayer, after ordering us to be future-oriented, reminds us that, as creatures, we are very much bound to the present. We cannot live only in terms of God's kingdom glory tomorrow, nor with heaven in mind. We live in the present always. Hence we are taught to pray, Give us this day our daily bread. Matthew chapter 6 verse 11 The present in a fallen world is commonly a difficult time. This is, after all, a fallen world, a realm in which every man seeks to be his own God, determining good and evil, law and morality for himself. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 This present world preferred a murderer to Jesus Christ, and its evil temper is very much in power now. Illusions about our world are dangerous. Do many churchmen believe that we have a good world, which only needs Christ as a donum super additum, as a plus added to it, not as the regenerator of all things and the remaker of this world order. Because we are creatures, we cannot be Stoics. Stoicism believed in man's divinity and thus sought to transcend all creaturely feelings and distresses. We are plainly told in John chapter 11 verse 35, the Bible's shortest verse, Jesus wept that our Lord was troubled and filled with grief at times. Are we holier than Christ if we become Stoics and show no distress, grief, exuberance and laughter as the occasion may require? We are creatures, and God expects us to recognize our creatureliness because we are then most open to Him and to our need of Him. We are never called to behave like a corpse and therefore have no reaction to the world around us. A creature bleeds when cut and grieves when hurt. Stoicism fosters prayerlessness because it seeks to rise above human reactions. The Stoic can never say, in the words of the old Negro spiritual, Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Calvin called Stoicism a proud wisdom. Stoicism, he said, presents an image of patience, which is unreal and ungodly. At present, there are among Christians modern Stoics who think it is wrong to groan and to weep, and even to grieve in loneliness. These, he said, are wild opinions. Our Lord wept for his own calamities as well as for those of others. 
if to be sorrowful is displeasing to God, how can we be pleased with his confession that his soul was sorrowful unto death? John chapter 16 verse 20, Matthew chapter 26 verse 38, Luke chapter 22 verse 44. We are creatures and we have needs. We are commanded to pray for them. We cannot reduce prayer to asking for needs. The priority belongs to God's kingdom. On the other hand, there is no question that our needs have an urgency with us. Edward J. Goodspeed's rendering of John chapter 14 verses 13 and 14 is of interest in this context. Anything you ask for as followers of mine, I will grant, so that the Father may be honoured through the Son. I will grant anything you ask me for as my followers. This is a remarkable promise. Its only qualification is, according to the King James, in my name, and for good speed, as my followers. The emphasis is on the name. Goodspeed shifts it to us as followers. In either case, this is an amazing promise, Halsby said of it. Here we are told what the real purpose of prayer is, namely, to glorify the name of God. We are quick to make use of prayer for the purpose of praying ourselves away from suffering and difficulty and of gaining some advantage for ourselves and our dear ones. This is why we have so many disappointments in our prayer life. That is the reason for the many unfulfilled petitions of the past. No, my friend, on the contrary, you should pray God for even greater simplicity of hearts in your daily fellowship with Him. It is written, as you know, In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Nothing in your daily life is so unimportant and inconsequential that the Lord will not help you by hearing your prayers with reference to it. But let us remember that the purpose of prayer is to glorify the name of God. Whether we pray for things large or small, let us always add, If it will glorify thy name, then perform this miracle and help us. But if it will not glorify thy name, then let us remain in our extremity. However, give us power to glorify thee through it. It is hard to disagree with this, and yet difficult also to agree with it. It is a theologically correct statement, but God does not readily listen to us theologians, and sometimes not at all. When Ahab prayed, he met no theological conditions, he was an evil and ungodly man, asking out of a self-interest that God's judgment should fall after his death. And God heard Ahab's prayer. 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 25 to 29. Again, Elijah, deeply discouraged, prayed for death. God had just performed the great miracle on Mount Carmel through Elijah. But Elijah expecting dramatic changes to follow, now wanted to die, since nothing had changed. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4 Neither prayer could be called as truly in God's name. God, however, granted Ahab's prayer, and he fed Elijah and made clear his work would continue and grow under Elisha. In both instances, God was mindful of the creatureliness of Ahab and Elijah, even as he is of ours. Thus, we are commanded to pray for our daily needs, our daily bread. Our praying does not determine whether or not God will give us what we want. We cannot ascribe to our prayer, our spirit in praying or to the number of people who unite with us to pray for a particular need, any special power with God. On man's side, there is no power, only a duty to pray. The determination is entirely on the part of God. Hence, we pray, 
Thy will, thy determination or decree, be done, knowing also that we are in his will or determination, and we are never forgotten. Our Lord tells us, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 to 31. Praying is thus more than a formula or an appeal to a bank teller. It is a personal relationship between creature and creator. He commands us to make our daily needs known to him. The rest is in his sovereign hands. This means that those who talk about having an especial power with God, of receiving much because they go to him in the, quote, right, end quote, spirit, are converting prayer, asking and receiving, from a matter of grace to works. Men of little faith and at times very weak character are sometimes given their petitions by the Lord, and men of great faith have gone to the stake. It is not for us to judge God, nor determine which prayer should get the desired answer, We are told, however, and by our Lord, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke chapter 18 verse 1. 